Hey everyone and welcome back. So in this video we will be adding movement to the player blueprint that we've already created. So we had a little bit of movement included previously which was simply the player being launched up. So if we go back to our player blueprint we can see that we just had our add impulse launching the player into the air. So the first thing we're going to do is I haven't removed this for a reason because we're going to move this down to our event tick will be the way that we get this moving forward. So the next thing is we want to go back to the axes that we added the movement on and we're going to zero that back out to zero. We don't want this moving up and forward in this case is going to be the X axis based on where we're looking and based on the positioning of the spring arm looking at the character in this direction. So if we were to go back into transform mode here, remember that is W and we were to move this in a certain direction, we can see that most of the movement here, we're getting some Z movement as well. Um, in fact, that's not very clear because this is on an angle. So I'm going to select the camera. It's going to be the same problem. Uh, but we can see that the red arrow is uh, moving, which is moving forward and backwards, is moving over here on the X axis. So from that, we know that our movement is going to be X axis based to go forward and back. So this is actually going to be some really simple logic. So if we get into this now, we're going to, first of all, get our add impulse and we want to break the vector into its three floats. So we're going to right click on the yellow pin and we want to split the structure pin. The structure pin is just a structure of those three float values, which are the elements which go into making a vector three, which is our three floats. With that split, we want to affect just the X axis. We're going to leave the Y and the Z as zero. And there's a few things that we want, first of all. So first, we want to make sure that this is frame rate independent, which means that regardless of the system specification of playing this on, uh, frame rate isn't taken into account with how far or how fast this moves. Now, to do that, we are actually presented with a variable that we need here, which is the delta seconds. And basically, it's the time in between each frame. So if you're running on a system which is running at a lower FPS, the time between each frame is obviously going to be higher and vice versa. So a faster PC will be running more frames and you'll be getting smaller periods of time in between each frame. So we want to track this and to do that, we can select from the pin, we'll drag off and we want to promote this to variable. So if we'll promote this to our own variable and we're just going to call this the delta seconds. And you're probably asking right now, well, that's called delta seconds as well. Why don't we just use that? And that's perfectly fine. But we're going to want to use this in different sections of the blueprint. And rather than dragging this around and having loads of wires making this look untidy and a bit messy, uh, this means that we can now control drag and select the delta seconds we've just created. And we can put this anywhere that we want without any of the, uh, the wires hanging around. So it's just going to be a little bit tidier. So again, housekeeping for later on. And this is now constantly being tracked on the event tick. So we're now storing this value and we want to plug the return pin from that into add impulse. So now we're going to add impulse to our player every frame. Now the next thing we want to do is we want to add the movement on the actual X axis. So if we drag off of the X impulse, we just we can just type the multiplication value. We can just type the multiplication sign and we want to multiply float by a float. So the first float that we want to multiply this by is actually the delta second. So we can just drag off of the return value here and we will then multiply this by another value. So again, hit the multiply sign and again, we'll do a float by float. Now, if you remember in the previous video, I said that the uh, the mass of the object is going to come into play. So we want to control drag the player object that we created earlier. So we're going to get a reference to the player cube. And from this, we can get loads of information about the object simply by typing things like scale. So we can set the scale, we can get the scale, uh, we can find out its current velocity. So if we type velocity, we can see we'll get things like the components current velocity. And we can do all of this type of thing within Blueprint. So again, a really, really handy way to get values is you'll just get the reference to that object, pull off of the pin, and you can start trying to see if you can get access to points of interest within that component. Now, what we're interested in is the mass. So we're just gonna type get mass. And now you can see we can get the mass of the object, which is the float value, which is just returning how heavy this is. If we go to the player, this is pretty much just pulling out this value here, mass in kilograms, which is 177.8 something. And likewise, you can pull any of these out. So if you wanted to know whether or not this is being rendered, as an example, again, you can pull out, uh, type in rendering or render, and we can get some of the information here to say whether or not this is being rendered in the world. So pretty much anything you see in the details panel, you can get access to that via Blueprint as well. Now, the reason that we're getting the mass, uh, this is two part reason. We actually don't need to do that in blueprints. However, if we were to be using C++, this is something which is just as standard part of the equation of adding an impulse in C++. So it's kind of good habit to know that and to get into the habit of using it anyway. And the other reason is we are multiplying 
this value by its mass. Um, and if you remember, the reason for this is that we will be otherwise using a really large number when we represent the speed, because I had to add something like 50 million, I think it was in the previous video, just to get it to launch upwards a little bit, because uh, nothing else is being taken into account. So now we're going to multiply the mass of the object, so at least we can take a, uh, a couple of zeros off of the value that we'll be adding to its force. Now the force of the value, I think I've played about this before, something like 2000 for the movement speed should be perfectly fine to get this going in the x-axis. So if we just type 2000 in here, and we're going to come back to that in a bit in a moment as well, and we'll hit play, we can see that we've been flung forward this time rather than up. So that's the correct type of result that we wanted. Probably notice there when I mentioned previously that we're going to have an issue with the rotation of the camera, that is that when we're spinning because we are hitting the floor and bouncing around, the camera moves with it, which is a little bit jarring and it's not what we want. So we're going to fix two things now. So back in the blueprint, the first thing we want to do is we have what is called a magic number here, which is just a number which we've created fairly arbitrarily and it doesn't mean anything. So we're going to right click on this pin again and we're going to promote this to another variable and we will just call this the forward force. So when we come back, we know that this is the value which whatever is in here is the force in which we'll be moving forward. So we need to hit compile and we'll see that the default value over here has retained the 2000 that we added. So it's quite handy that if you've already filled a value, it will remember that and it will pre-fill the variable that you promote it to to have that value as well. Now, the next thing we want to do, that's not going to make any difference. If you come back in, it's still going to move at the same speed. Another problem I just noticed as well is we don't have enough floor. So if we go back to the viewport quickly and go to our floor and we can just hit R, remember, to scale this out and just pull on the x-axis, which is the red arm, to give this a little bit more length. And with that done, hit T to get the transform back and we can scale out and just keep pulling this so that we have a bit more floor to play about with. So now when we come back in, at least we're not going to be falling into nothingness. So the next thing we're going to fix is the rotation. Now the first thing we want to do is come to the spring arm and we'll make sure that we do not inherit the pitch, yule, or the roll from the parent actor. So this means this is this camera, regardless of what the cube is doing, is just going to keep facing forward. So now if we do that, we can see that we have the cube bouncing along and the camera is staying locked at what we want it to look at. So it's not inheriting any of its movement, which is perfect because that means at least we're not going to get motion sickness whilst we're watching this. Now, the next thing I like to do is to add a very small amount of camera lag. So we're just going to add the camera lag on. Um, and this means that it's not going to snap to it so quickly. Um, it's just going to give a little bit more of a polished feel to the uh, the camera arm. So that's the first two things. Uh, now that one didn't really look too much different, so it will probably look a little bit more different when the cube is actually travelling at speed. And to get that, we want to obviously stop this rolling motion. So we're going to go back to the cube again, and we want to go down to the physics options down here and go to the constraints. Now in the constraints, we want this to have a little bit of bounce on the x-axis, or a little bit of rotation on the x-axis when it bounces, but we don't want that to happen on the y or the z. So if we come back in, remember in the viewport that we have X, Y, and Z for the rotation. Uh, so we're leaving the rotation on the X, which means it will have a little bit, bit of leeway to tilt when it hits the floor, but we don't want it rolling over or sideways and completely changing direction, which is the, the Y and the Z axes when it comes to rotation. Um, also, if you hover over these, you'll also find that they're called roll, pitch, and yule. So that's going to be useful to know as well because when we look at what we've just disabled, we've just disabled the the pitch and the yule. So now if we press play one more time, we can now see that we are being sent in a nice straight line. There's no rotating, there's no bouncing out of control. And uh, we have the start of our run, and you can see that the cube is kind of making distance from the camera, and that is the camera lag. So if we just come back into the spring on one more time, disable the camera lag again. And again, this is completely optional, but um, you can see that that is pretty much staying spot on in place with the uh, the camera, which just doesn't look quite as interesting. So I'm going to personally, for me, I'm going to leave that on in my project. And you can change the, the speed of the camera lag, so how quickly or slowly this catches up to the object in question. And you can also give it a max distance as well. So if you're playing this for a bit longer, you probably don't want it to keep losing the cube. So you can lower this within a certain, um, within a certain threshold. Okay, so we have our cube moving forward. So obviously the next logical step is going to be getting this moving sideways. So we have some control over where this is going. 
Now the first step to doing this is to go to our project settings and we want to add some input to the game. So we'll go down to our input settings, which are down here, and we want something called axis mapping. So we have action mappings, which are single press instances. So if you had like a, a jump or a dash where you press a certain button to do that once, that would be an action mapping. And axis mapping is value based and it's something that you tend to hold down or kind of tilt into like an analog press. So to get one of these, we're going to hit the plus button. We will drop this down and I'm just going to call this move right. The reason for that is that we have this scale value here. So this will actually be our left and our right, but people tend to choose right for some reason as the name. So the first thing we want to do is add another one of these and give this a scale of minus one. So minus one is going to be left. Zero is going to be not moving at all, which will be its, its default value. And one will be moving right. So for the value of one moving right, this is going to be D. I'm going to use W, A, S, and D for these movements. So we will just type D and then move down to the D button. A, so will be to move left. So again, press A and then scroll down and find the A key. And of course, if you wanted to make this slightly more universal, you can add another one for right and type in right for say the right arrow. So keyboard right is the right arrow. Press it again and press left or type left for the left arrow. And again, make sure that with the left, any, any keys you're defining to be left, make sure this is minus one on the, uh, the value. And then we'll go back to our blueprint. Now that we've called this, remember the name that you've called your axis mapping. So if you've called it something different, remember this, because we're now going to search for that here. So I'm going to type move right and look for the axis event, not the value. And the event will actually give us this event pin that we can pull off. The value would have just returned at the value being called, which isn't 100% useful for what we're doing. Now, similar to the event tick, this is called constantly. This is updated every so many times per second based on the frame rate. And what we want to do is we can actually copy most of this. So we're going to take the add impulse and we'll select that and press Control W to copy that. And we'll plug that straight into the move right event. This already has our structure broken down, which is perfect. And when it comes to the values that we'll be calculating to set the sideways movement, it's going to be slightly more complicated. So rather than copying and pasting these, I want to make sure that we run through this one step at a time so we can see what's happening. We will actually copy and paste this though. So if we get the player and the mask, as we already have those. Now, this is where it's going to start varying a little bit is we want to come off of here and we'll multiply this by a float the same way that we did last time. The float that we'll be multiplying here will be the sideways force. And I think a value of 25 worked for that one. So we're going to get the mass. We're going to multiply that by the force that we want it to move sideways. Now, the next thing we want is another float by float. And this time we're going to be getting the delta seconds. So remember that we've stored that. And to get access to this, we just want to control and drag in the delta seconds. So that's going to return the current delta value. And this is where it actually gets different is that we're going to add in another multiplication. So we're going to do a float by a float again. And this one, I'm just going to unhook those and actually plug that into the bottom one just for tidiness. That won't make a difference. I'm going to plug that into the axis value. So remember that the axis value is returning either minus one, zero, or one. So if you're pressing left, it's returning minus one. If you're pressing nothing, it's constantly returning zero. And if you're pressing the right key, then it's returning one. So we're going to be multiplying these things by either minus one, zero, or one. And the result of that, we're going to plug into the y axis because remember that we're moving uh, forward on the x axis, left and right on the y axis, and up and down on the z axis. So with all of that done, we should now have the movement ready for the sideways movement of our cube. Okay, so we also need to make sure that this is a velocity change. Um, and this just means that the strength will be updated as a velocity rather than a change of impulse. Otherwise, it's going to be a little bit too weak to actually move the cube. So we can see we now have some nice sharp movement of the cube. If you didn't have that, it will be adding it, but it's going to be at a very, very small rate. So make sure that we hit the velocity change. And we now have our sideways movement. So you've probably noticed again, I've done the same thing. This is just a test value. But now that we know the test value works, we want to right click on this. We will promote this to variable and we will call this side force. OK, so whenever we know that a value is definitely correct or is definitely going to be part of an equation that we're going to be using, we want to make sure that we promote this to a variable. It's going to store the 25 that we've added in as our test value. And we now have our sideways movement. So we have our cube or our player working perfectly in the world as we expected. So with that done, I'll leave that video here for today. As always, if you've enjoyed this or found it useful, then please do leave a like and share the video to your friends. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button to be kept up to date with the latest content on the channel and the future videos for this playlist. And as ever, thanks for watching and I will see you all next time.